Hey everybody, welcome into the Mining Stock Daily Long Form episode here this week. A little bit of a uh, makeshift episode to get you into the weekend here. So we're going to have two separate discussions. First, we're going to talk some copper development in the state of Arizona with George Ogilvy of Arizona Sonoran Copper. Uh, there's some a lot of movement there at the Cactus Project, uh, not only with their Medicine Springs area that they continue to drill, but we're going to talk a lot about permitting and also the, the copper framework in a state like Arizona, what it means for infrastructure and also the technology development happening in that state. And then we're going to move to Ecuador. Uh, not too long ago, there was news that Silver Court Metals was acquiring Adventus and the Eldomo project, and there's moving parts on that deal as well. So we welcome in the heads of both Adventus and Silver Corp for a conversation regarding uh, the interesting jurisdictional profile that's going to happen with Silver Corp once this deal is done. A special thank you to Fireweed Metals, Arizona Snore and Copper. Victoria Gold and Visa Silver for their continued support of the podcast. And if you wouldn't mind, hit that like, subscribe, and share the podcast or the YouTube video uh, if you get it in front of other people and new investors. All right, everybody, let's jump into the conversation. Have a wonderful weekend. Be well. All right, everybody, welcome back in. We are going to conclude this week with a long conversation with our friend George Ogilvie from Arizona Sonoran Copper Company. They do trade on the TSX with ASCU and on the OTCQX with ASCUF. Uh, George, uh, we're going to dive into a lot of topics here with that cactus project down in Arizona. Uh, But let's start things off. Main Springs has really been that priority area uh, of cactus, uh, and there's been a lot of drilling and exploration there. So maybe let's, uh, you know, jump into this and, and, and let people who maybe have forgotten about Maine Springs about really the opportunity you think this area has for the project. Yeah, well, absolutely, Trevor. So um, since December of last year, we've had drills situated on the Main Spring property. And I believe uh, today into the market, we've released approximately 54 holes of drill assay information. And what's interesting about Mainspring is it appears to be the southern extension of Park Salier, which currently right now in the pre-feasibility study is showing as an underground mine that would be uh, mined via a sub-level cave operation. And what we found with Mainspring is that 900 meters south of the property boundary from Park Salier, we're now finding mineralization that's within 42 meters or 150 feet of surface. Now, that mineralization ranges anywhere between 0.2 and sort of 0.5 total percent copper. So it's not as robust as Park Salier, which in situ is better than. 1% total soluble copper, but there's definitely an opportunity, you know, to potentially have an open pit scenario at Mainspring that you could start in the south at relatively shallow, uh, low strip ratio. And then as you continue to mine the mineralization to the north, eventually it would bring you in uh, right on top of uh, Park Salier. So that's something that we're exploring right now uh, in a preliminary economic assessment that's due to come out uh, in the summer of this year. Okay, that PEA. Now, let's clarify. Is that going to be specifically for Mainspring or is it going to be for the more robust project? No, it's going to be for the entire project because there are implications with Mainspring and Park Salier that might require us to relook at the entire project and the resequencing of the various assets. Um, and obviously we wanna ensure that uh, the economics at the end of the day continue to improve over and above the PFS that we put out in February of this year. Yeah, and you and I have talked a lot about this, You know, the balancing between that PFS that was reported uh, back in February and this kind of updated PEA, and it, it's, it, it potentially could be a very different project here for the, for the overall cactus project. And uh, George, let's, you know, with Mainsprings here, you know, I think from the investor standpoint, it's like when you're starting to look 
at an open pit. Most companies want to go after some of that highest grade that they possibly can, the most accessible to pay off whatever uh, wh whatever debt comes their way in that financing, right? And so you look at Mainsprings and you, as you said, you know, may doesn't have that robust grades as a lot of the other project, but uh, George, I mean, here we are, we're at $4.60 per pound of copper. Uh, yeah. we, you know, if you it just, it was like just yesterday, we were at just over $5 for copper and the market was going wild. And maybe there's a little bit of speculation in that, but a lot of that was a very foundational, uh, in its move. But with these higher copper prices, I mean, can you justify, you know, going after a 0.3, 0 0.4% total soluble copper? With this, I mean, what are those, you know, how do those economics look here at Mainspring? No, I, 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 absolutely, yeah. Trevor. I mean, um, if you think about copper just as maybe $10,000 a ton, and remember uh, over a week ago, copper went over $11,000 a ton. So at 0.1% copper at $10,000 a ton, you're looking at $10 a ton revenue rock. So at 03 percent copper, if we do the math, you'd be looking at $30 a ton revenue rock. But, mm -hmm. you know, to mine open pit, you're probably looking at sub $3 a ton operating costs. Your processing cost is going to be another, you know, 3 to $4 a ton. And then you've got your G&A on top of that. So at the end of the day, from an operating cost perspective, you can probably mine you know, for in and around 10 to $15 a ton. And you're generating $30 a ton at 0.3% copper on $10,000 a ton rock. And I think everybody listening in on the, you know, the broadcast today would probably agree that the likelihood that copper is going to go a lot higher, you know, than $4.50 and uh, $5 that we've seen in the last month is probably, you know, very, very high, high, highly likely. Yeah. Uh, so this PEA, the expectation, it's going to be Q3. So we're not, we're not far from there. We're, <laughs> we're the last month of Q2 here, George. Um, it, it's going to be really interesting. It, it, maybe let's take a step back. Now, you've been at the helm here at Arizona Sonoran for, what, two and a half years, I think it has been? I'll be three, three years this July. Uh, yeah, three years. Okay. And maybe let's, you know, let, let's see the forest through the tree, trees here and how this project has absolutely evolved and mm -hmm. changed in three years but not yep. only as far as the technical aspects of but a potential mining situation but the opportunities that were presented on the backdrop of a, a copper market and a need for uh u.s produced copper i mean maybe you know just i'll give you the book here and and you know and, and read off you know give us a sense of how so many things have changed well, absolutely. I mean, remember when we got this project out of the state trust in um, late 2019, at that time, there was only 224 million pounds of copper in the resource, which was the historical surface stockpile sitting on surface. And since then, over the last three and a half to four years, as we've continued to drill on the project, today we're now sitting at 7.4 billion pounds of contained copper in the ground and I would expect with uh, Mainspring coming into the equation now and then potentially looking at maybe a change of mining method at Park Salier with lower cutoff grades I would think in the next three months this resource is likely going to grow well beyond nine billion pounds of copper and then with further exploration success that we're actually seeing today at Cactus West as we assign some of the Newton monies to drilling out the primary, uh, this resource by 2025 will be well north of 10 billion pounds of copper in the ground in Arizona on private land with access to water, the mine already substantially permitted on private land, no federal nexus and a strong social license. And uh, you've heard me say many times on this show that success in business in a lot of instances comes down to timing uh, and a little bit of luck. And I think our timing on this is going to be absolutely perfect. And uh, we'll take that little bit of luck as well, for sure. 
All right. Well, the, the timing is obviously everything <laughs> in so many aspects of life, but definitely mining, but uh, timing and permitting uh, for practice for projects such as cactus that, that the, sometimes can cause a little bit of a headache, not only for management teams, but also for investors. Well, exactly. And look, I mean, I think everybody knows that copper prices are going to go a lot higher in the next five to 10 years. And I think the beauty of our project is that it's got very short timelines to first, um, you know, production once we make a um, get the project financing in place and make a construction and development decision. We're looking at 18 to 24 months at some juncture, you know, in 2025, we'll, we'll be in that position. And we could see first cathode here before the end of 2026, early 2027, which would then allow us to take advantage of what I believe is going to be a, you know, a secular structural deficit and in, in copper that we're going to see over the next five to 10 years. Yeah. George, the copper market has been absolutely on fire uh recently um and i want to take a step back listen like 2021 2022 when the lithium move happened we were seeing mm. a lot of oems take on offtake agreements with lithium companies even some uh, uh nickel companies as well and and, it, and so we've talked about you know the manufacturing of electric vehicles that has kind of become a little bit stale in the last year i might say Mm -hmm. But I've been doing a lot of research regarding digital infrastructures, the need for data centers, uh, the amount of energy it will take to power these data centers. You know, on the back of that, you're also talking about semiconductor plants being constructed not far from the backyard of the Cactus Project in Arizona okay. as well. And, I, and I'm creating in this mind a scenario, and perhaps this scenario will not come into fruition, but it is something similar to what we saw back with the OEMs, the electric vehicle manufacturers, not too long ago. And I keep on thinking, it's like, if these companies, like the tech companies, the Microsofts, the Amazons, are going to be in need of creating new, bigger, more power, power necessary data centers, is it out of the ordinary or out of the question to consider that those companies, very similar to their peers in the EV market, may say it's going to take a lot of copper to build those data centers, and we need to source that quite like the Teslas of the world did. Yeah, not too no, long I ago. No, I don't think it's out of uh, reason to uh, to consider that as a possibility. And of course, the beauty of the product that Arizona Sonoran will be producing is its copper cathode, and it can be sold right into the U.S. domestic market for copper wiring, copper tubing, copper foil, you know, for all of those things that you spoke about. So uh, it's not a case of producing a concentrate here and having to, you know, go to a smelter, particularly in Asia, offshore, and then resold back to the U.S. This is U.S. domestic manufacture and, and supplied right here in the good old U.S. What, what would a deal like that look like for you? You know, I, I mean, I guess what, what, what happens if somebody comes to you and says, uh, you know, we're interested in some sort of agreement yeah. with Arizona Snorin. Well, obviously, it would, be a, it would be a great opportunity for us that we would want to explore. But, you know, sometimes I, I find, you know, companies in the junior sector can give away too much too early and they really need time to evolve their projects and create more value. And I certainly mm -hmm. think that that is the case here. I think if we can continue to de-risk the project with this PEA, another updated PFS definitive feasibility study in 2025. And I've said this before, I think by then we will have seen real interest rates come from the Fed and, you know, various, uh, the EC, the e e European Union, other central banks around the world. I think by the summer of next year, we're going to see copper prices a lot, lot higher than what we see today. And that's going to be at a time when we'd be completing our uh, definitive bankable feasibility study. We would then be looking at project financing and with a fully de-risk project having more proven reserves at a time when the copper price is much higher. We can then start to entertain, you know, selling our product uh, or with offtake agreements or to end users 
but having a lot more leverage to negotiate better terms. So it would be a great situation to be in, to be talking to those type of companies, but at the same time to maximize, maximize value for the shareholders, it all comes down to timing. Yeah. Would it make a powerful statement if one of those companies who were building, operating, constructing in Arizona uh, approached a company like Arizona Snort and really oh, kept everything everything and just so succinct? Absolutely, because, I mean, you, you, you've kind of got the holy grail there from a, from a junior company's perspective and that you've probably got a partner that could assist with financing and you absolutely know from an execution perspective that the mine is ultimately going to get built and produce that uh, that cathode for the end user. Yeah. Well, this goes out. We, I, I want to go back and talk about this permitting. Uh, you just did a webinar this week here, George, and, and there's a lot of discussion about permitting. It's a different animal uh, being on private land than a lot of other projects within Arizona. And, uh, you know, I'm not one to be an expert on the layers, the layers of uh, permitting in Arizona based on you know, who operates or who owns the land, whether it be forestry service, BLM or private, but, you know, maybe sh share more information about how cactus is really situated on private land and how that permitting process yeah. appears to be a little bit easier than a lot of your peers. Well, it's a lot, a lot easier, you know, if we, if, if we just state the obvious, I mean, no federal nexus all on private land. So it really gives us uh, defined timelines to receiving our permits. So the way it works is once we submit an application for a permit, uh, once the application is administratively accepted, and we've seen that take a couple of days to a couple of weeks, but once that application is administratively accepted, it starts a clock ticking, and within six months, the regulator must give us a response to our permit. You know, with being four years on the project, the longest we've had to wait for any permit to date from when it was administratively accepted to being physically received in the office has been five months, which was the amended aquifer protection permit. So um, the cactus project today, as per a PEA, which is now redundant, given it was re recently replaced in February by the pre-feasibility study, but had we been proceeding ahead as per that PEA with an 18 year mine life, with a surface stockpile, Cactus West and Cactus East, and producing up to you know, maximum 40,000 tons a year, but averaging 28,000 tons of cathode a year, the project today is fully permitted. So what we've got to do now is we've got to incorporate Park Sailor into that uh, uh, application permitting process because that takes the production up to 55,000 short tons of cathode production and a maximum of 70,000 tons and the mine life marginally increases to 21 years. And we would anticipate that before the end of this year, we would have those amended permits in place as we head into 2025. And look, just to be clear, there's then going to be a further amendments required in 2025 as we complete an updated PFS and eventually a definitive bankable feasibility study. But we wanted to do it this way within the company because we wanted to show the market that with every iteration and improvement of the plan, we could get the updated permit. And we didn't want to go years without having that uh, updated permit in hand for the market then to be concerned or worried that we weren't going to get the updated permits. And doing it this way, we've spoken to the regulators. They're happy to accommodate us this way, and they believe it's actually better because it means that we're in constant dialogue with the regulators on how the project is evolving, and they can you know, give us feedback appropriately if we need to tweak or change our plans accordingly. Okay. That, I'm glad you mentioned a uh, amended permit because that was my follow-up question before you got to that point. It's like if Park Salier needed a, a a full permit or if it could just be amended from cactus. So I think amended you, you just, from cactus, yeah. given it's all contiguous on the same land package, uh, it's all part of the same mineralized system. The aquifer that we have in the ground is all common, so it's all under the same uh, aquifer protection permit. 
Okay. And Main Springs as well, when it comes down to it, if that's what were to happen, amended? Main Spring is exactly the same. And that's what I was alluding to that in 2025, mm -hmm. yeah. once we have a, a updated pre-feasibility study, then Main Spring, we will be applying for amended permits with, with Main Spring in there. Okay. George, I want to take another step back and let's talk about uh, the copper equities in general. We saw the producers of copper just uh, you know, do really, really well. And this last quarter, based on those copper moves, uh, we saw Anglo-American finally put the nail in the mm -hmm. coffin on that deal from BHP saying, no, we will not sell even at that valuation. So there's been a lot of attention here at copper. But these uh, earlier stage uh, exploration or development equities maybe haven't had huge runs that we've seen a lot of uh, your gold peers say uh, mm -hmm. have in the last couple of months. Uh, however, I will say the Arizona Storm chart is looking fairly constructive. It's making, for most part, higher higher highs and higher lows. So the uptrend is there. But, you know, the conversation you're having with investors or people on the street, you know, what's it going to take to really get more attention, <clears throat> more uh, that smart money, speculative cash flow into these development stories? Um. I think if we see some real M&A activity in the space, that could really act as a spark. As you sort of indicated there, you know, there's been a few groups making overtones about M&A, but we haven't, even, haven't seen anything actually transact yet. But I certainly think uh, by the end of the year, we're likely to see uh, at least one, if not two, M&A deals actually, actually occur. And I think that will generate quite a bit of excitement in the uh, in the junior development space, particularly for those developers that you know are perceived as low risk and uh, high highly executable projects that can be in production in a relatively short period of time. So I think that that's going to bring in a speculation to the space. I think everybody is aware that the copper prices ran up in the last month. It was more mostly related to a short squeeze on COMEX, so a bit of a a financing issue which appears to be being resolved. But I'll go back to the point that I raised and that, you know, if if there were short inventories on COMEX and it took the copper price to $5 a pound or $11,000 a ton, what is going to happen in 2025 when we start to see real green shoots of growth around the economically developed world? And and I think China is slowly but surely beginning to see progress with their property sector, and and of course they're producing uh, copper uh, today as if it's still going out of fashion. Mm -hmm. So I think with all of those all of those points coming to the fore next year, we're likely to see physical inventories and all the bonded warehouses around the world falling to historical lows, and I think at that point in time with a growing demand. We're going to see copper prices much, much higher than, than what we've seen just in the last month with a short squeeze on, on COMEX. Right. Like we said, timing might be everything here, and uh, it's a great story. George, thanks so much for your time. Uh, we're going to be following up with uh, more from Arizona Sonoran throughout the year. There's a lot happening. Uh, we're, you know, we'll be talking a lot of the uh, Newton technology in the next phase of testing there as well uh, in the weeks and months to come. So, George. Have yourself a great rest of your weekend. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you, Trevor. All right, everybody. Welcome back in. A second segment here on our Friday Long Form episode. We're going to talk a little M&A action in uh, the precious metals and copper uh, uh, development space. Uh, a little while ago, there was big news. Uh, Silver Corp actually has gone out and acquired Adventist Mining Corp and the Eldoma project down in Ecuador. And we're going to break this down with both gentlemen from the company. Happy to welcome in President Lon Shaver from Silver Corp Metals and also Christian Cargill Samard from Adventist Mining. Christian, Lon, thanks so much for doing this. Thanks, Chair. Thank yeah. Uh, Lon, I'm going to start with you uh, since you're the, basically the acquirer of this. Uh, Silver Corp, very interesting project. We've been watching news out of this company for quite some time. Uh, there's a lot of interesting jurisdiction you operate in, and obviously you're adding to it here with this acquisition. Uh, maybe talk about, you know, why this made sense for you and investors. 
Well, well, I think uh, why this makes sense is is pretty clear when you you know you get to know um, about Adventus and in particular their lead project El Domo in Ecuador. And I think it's been no secret that we've been uh, on the acquisition hunt to find um, sort of our next project. Uh, that's taken us to uh, some, some different places around the world. Not all of them have worked out in terms of closing the deals, but I think the key factor is that uh, the Eldomo project in Ecuador uh, has uh, all the studies done, good economics, but the key factor for us is that it's permitted, and so it's ready to go. Okay. Uh, Christian, how about you? Let's talk. I mean, this is you know a big deal for, a big deal for Adventus, and why, why did this deal make sense to bring it in uh, to Silvercorp shareholders? Well, we've been at this uh, in Ecuador, in particular, advancing El Domo for over six years from an initial resource through all the stage gates, uh, including a couple of years ago, completing the feasibility study, putting together project financing, construction team. Uh, this year, we finally got our permits and we're ready to construct, but we were short final equity check uh, to, to fill the mine. While commodity prices are improving uh, overall uh, in investor demand uh, funds flows for uh, for investing in junior mining isn't there yet and so we we made a determination as as a board that uh, combining with silver corp uh, lots of great attributes but one of the the best parts of it is they have a lot of cash uh, and and that is best better off for shareholders uh, from a net asset value for share perspective than trying to find the money in the in, in the markets uh, if it was even there and doing it alone. Okay. Uh, Lon, let's talk about uh, a little bit of Silver Corp in that jurisdiction. Uh, you got a lot of operations and insight into China. Now you're working in Ecuador. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it, I don't think there's another company based in Canada or Vancouver quite like Silver Corp, to be quite honest with you. Um, you know, and talk about maybe the, some of the constructive feedback you had received on this deal, both positive and maybe, uh, you know, maybe constructive pushback as well. Yeah, I really haven't had a lot of pushback when, when uh, people are presented with the facts and the understanding that, you know, we have been looking around the world. We have been looking in various jurisdictions. Uh, it's not our first time looking in Ecuador at projects. Uh, there, in fact, is a uh, pre-existing relationship you know, between our CEO and uh, the, the CEO of uh, the partner company that, uh, that Christian entered into uh, the joint venture for El Domo with. So, so we've looked at Ecuador before. I, I think the feedback is constructive in the sense that uh, this is a permanent project, as I mentioned, uh, from a size uh, and a fit, you know, strategically for us, uh, it's a good fit. You know, we've built a number of mines that are uh, flotation producing concentrates um, you know, in this case, we're adding uh, copper, a significant copper contribution to the mix, but, um, you know, also adding metals that we're already producing in silver, lead, zinc, and even gold. So I, I don't think that there's really a, a big deviation from the strategy. It's been for us looking at what can we bring into the company that makes sense, is achievable, and achieves our goal of uh, becoming a multi-mine, multi-jurisdiction platform. Yeah. Uh, El Domo currently has a proven probable mineral reserve of six and a half million tons at just under 2% copper, two and a half grams per ton gold, two and a half percent zinc, 45.7 grams per ton silver, and a quarter percent lead here. Uh, you know, th there's a third player in here. Uh, there's a partner here in Salazar Resources from El Domo. How does that play into this? What does that partnership look like? for this project, uh, you know, once this is all cleared and, and, and kind of merged, officially merged. Well, Christian, do you want to start and then I'll jump in? Tony uh, Salazar, who started Salazar Resources and his group is one of the most successful exploration group in Ecuador's history. Uh, I went down as a young investment banker in, I think, 2009, after the discovery of El Domo uh, and got to know Freddie and stayed in touch with him over the, the years. Uh, and so it wasn't difficult to you know, reconnect and start talking about deal and understand you know, what both parties were looking for in 2017. Uh, what Freddie wants is 
another mine to be built in Ecuador with his name connected to it and to have a partner that does things right and that they can trust and um, will uh, unlock that, uh, that, that legacy for him. What Freddie was looking for was a group that had the skills to advance the project through all the st stage gates, do it for, from an international standards perspective, and most importantly, be able to raise the capital to put it into production. So that is the basis of our understanding. The relationship continues to be very strong. Lon said, Silver Corp has had a relationship with, uh, with Freddie Salazar, at least since 2009 as well. Mm. So I see this as being a seamless transfer in that relationship and that partnership um, and a, a continued a great fit. I think I'll just me... quickly add from, from our standpoint is having a, a local partner invested in the project, familiar with the, the ways and operations in the country uh, is, is a good thing for the project yeah, I... going forward. Yeah. Can you maybe describe what that partnership with Salazar's looked like previously here, Lon? What you that that Christian just mentioned? Well, the the arrangement that uh, Adventus has with Salazar is effectively a a carried seventy five uh, twenty five um, joint venture. In the in the uh, the beginning of the operation, uh, there is a a payback mechanism that until Adventus's uh, equity con contribution to the project is paid back. Uh, the, the funds flowing to Salazar is 5% uh, in terms of the share of the project's uh, economics. But then once that payback threshold is met, then it's a 75, 25% joint venture. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, so this deal does come with the, with, with the financing. And Lon, I guess this is more or less a poignant question for you. Um, there was a concurrent private placement in which you subscribed to uh, 67 and a half million shares of Adventus. Uh, upon this deal at 30, 38 cents Canadian at the time, $25 million. You know, give us a sense of, you know, I guess, why did that deal, why did that private placement need to happen in order for this deal to move forward? Yeah. And, and what I would say is uh, adding that element to a, an M&A transaction uh, is not unusual. Uh, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've taken that approach in, in other, uh, in other deals that we've gone in uh, into uh, it was part of uh, the Dundee Osino transaction uh, at the outset as well. And, and when you look and break it down, really, we announce a transaction, um, but it takes some time to close. There's costs, expenses. There's a, a business that needs to be run. So there's that at a minimum. You know, but what we're also looking at here is a project that is permitted and ready to go ahead. So want to start looking at some early uh, areas that we can deploy capital to and get the project moving ahead so that it's not sitting there, um, you know, waiting until the deal closes. So, so those are two obvious elements. And then the, the last piece really of, of the puzzle for the financing is that when we look through uh, the project and the capital structure, there were a couple elements in, you know, in the capital structure from a financing standpoint that um, you know that we, we don't really need and, and really didn't want to pursue going forward, and so those are um, a credit facility that was pr provided by Trafigura, who's also mm -hmm. the project offtaker, and there was a convertible debenture held by Altius, and they had a right to convert that into an additional royalty. So when we looked through the project and uh, got comfortable with all the elements, those were two pieces that we felt uh, you know should be addressed, and so you'll see that in the use of proceeds. Uh, eliminating those two financing structures was uh, a significant portion of the use of proceeds from that financing. Are both of those uh, both of those um, facilities closed now? Have they been fully repaid? Yes. Okay, so yeah. no royalty, for, no no royalty for Thaltius. Well, Altius has a pre-existing 2% NSR royalty, Oh, okay. but this convertible would have allowed them to convert the debenture into an additional royalty. And okay. so our, our view is that it was prefer, uh, preferable to uh, create the simplicity and clarity to just keep the royalty where it is and not have that uh, outstanding option. Okay, but they still it, have it, the 2%. Yeah. Yes, yeah. That, that, that financing was mutually beneficial. If they didn't offer it, we would have asked for it. We, we were down to just a few million dollars uh, of cash starting May, uh, and we wouldn't have had sufficient cash to get through the closing of the transaction anyway. So all the things that Lon said, uh, now with the repayment of uh, Altius and Trafigur, we're debt-free. 
uh, and we have a little bit of extra change to start some de-risking aspects of, of construction before uh, before closing. Okay. All right. So, so th what 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 is next after this whole thing is kind of settled down? I mean, what is next for El Domo? What is the what does this company look like? Uh, you know, moving forward with personnel and, and obviously, you know, juris different jurisdictions here. Well, I, I can tackle that from our perspective and, and that, you know, Christian and Adventus have built up a team um, uh, to advance the project to this stage. Uh, and, you know, our view is that there's there's probably a few additions to the team to transition from developer into a construction you know, company that's building the project. But, but really, and that's that's what the priority is. You know, we're, we're buying this with a view to uh, moving ahead aggressively uh, with construction so that we can see a, uh, a production start, you know, latter half, second half of 2026, which is, you know, not far off from the original timing prior to uh, entering into this transaction. Okay. Yeah. As Lauren said, we, we built an amazing team in, uh, in Ecuador for anybody that would be considering buying Adventus, it's really a plug and play. Uh, it's just a small office here in Toronto where, where, where I am, but the majority of employees and the skill set to build a mine are, are in Ecuador. So uh, another good fit here with this transaction. Uh, they bring the cash, we bring the people, we bring the project, uh, lots of synergies. Christian, what do you do next? Well, unless uh, Silver Corp <laughs> gives me an offer I can't refuse. Uh, <laughs> Adventus has been my first uh, gig as a, as a CEO. Uh, we started Adventus uh, about seven years ago as really a shell with strong shareholders and, and uh, a mandate to build a significant uh, company. I, I never thought we would have taken the project through all the stage gates and you know, ready to start construction in copper, but Sometimes uh, companies just take a path of their own and you do what's best for the company uh, along the way and in the marketplace that, that you're given. So I've learned a lot. Uh, looking forward to uh, to using those experiences, skills, relationships uh, built to, to try something new. Um, maybe next year, maybe, maybe later this year, we'll see. Lon, you know, as far as personnel, obviously needing to be Chinese focused and now Ecuadorian focused, and then you have the, you know, the Canadian markets. And so there's a whole nother realm of expertise needed there. I mean, this is going to be an incredibly diversified company as far as just personnel goes, let alone just where the projects are from, where the company is based out of. Um, you know, talk about those those challenges of, of having such a diversified uh, you know, company, and definitely in a time where, you know, that East versus West, West geopolitics is that the it's on the front page of the newspapers almost every day. How do you how do you continue to manage that? Yeah, well, I, I think it's important, and while I wouldn't go so far as to say that uh, China is a set it and forget it kind of situation, you know, we've been operating there since two thousand and six. Uh, we have you know mine level management at each of the operations. Uh, but then we do have an operational head office in Beijing uh, that oversees those uh, the, those activities. So there's, uh, I would say, limited operational input from the Vancouver head office uh, on that. And so when you know when we look at going forward, there's very little changes uh, you know required as it relates to China. You know, Christian pointed out the great team that we're inheriting. Uh, there's probably um, you know, a few a few key hires, uh, you know, for the, the Vancouver office to reflect the fact that, you know, we're multi-jurisdictional. But, you know, I don't see it as being uh, that, that big of a challenge. And we've been ready for that challenge, you know, really, you know, going back, if, you know, people looked through our, our track record of uh, attempted M&A, uh, you know, going back to Guyana Goldfields in uh, in in 2020, you know, that would have required a shift and we were getting uh, ready for that until, you know, we were uh, outbid in that uh, endeavor. Uh, we were just recently uh, trying to buy a, an ASX listed company with a gold project in Tanzania, and that would have required a, uh, a staffing up and input and involvement from the Vancouver office as well as our, our Chinese head office. So, so I, I don't see it as being as dramatic a trans, um, you know, a, a transition. I think there'll be some uh, a few changes, but but not um, 
uh, nothing that we can't manage. Do you ever have desire to, you know, buy projects in quote unquote safer jurisdictions like Ontario or Nevada? <laughs> Don't get me started. Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I think the thing is, you know, what's very interesting is that the, the market's got sometimes a very, you know, skewed perception of risk. And, and you can go to those jurisdictions uh, and there seems to be a comfort level. Uh, you may pay a premium to get those projects, but that doesn't mean that it's smooth sailing with respect to uh, getting the project permitted, getting a license to operate from all the stakeholders. And so if you've paid a premium for one of these safe projects, but then you're stuck and not able to move forward, uh, you know, two, three, five, ten years, like look at some of the projects that have been on the books and uh, nobody ever you know, takes the project away from you um, because that's not allowed in these safe jurisdictions, but you never get the series of yeses that you need to move ahead with the project. And obviously you've, you've uh, outlaid cash or shares to acquire it uh, and you eliminate your return on investment or you reduce it for every year that you're delayed and having to funnel cash into the project as opposed to building a mine that starts to deliver cash and returns back to you. So... So we're, we're um, I think we're, we're very aware of, of that uh, risk perception and it's obviously, you know, in our court to go and show that uh, building a mine in Ecuador and delivering returns, you know, like some other companies have done here uh, is a, uh, a viable opportunity to add value to your company. Yeah. We, we think exactly the same way at the Silver Corp. And I should, should highlight that Silver Corp is one of the more amazing companies in our business taking a, a small mine back in 2006, 2007, and transforming uh, that small mine into 500 million US of free cash over you know, to almost a 20 year period. Uh, that kind of uh, financial discipline and, and uh, I'd say operating success, I'm looking forward you know, for them to transfer that in, into Ecuador. But we're in Ecuador because we felt like we could permit a, uh, a new mine in the country. Two mines were just permitted in construction at the time when we uh, entered. And we were able to get our permits in 27 months. You can compare that to the United States, an average is like 12 years, maybe 15 years, or something like that. Forget about permitting a new copper mine. So you want to go to jurisdictions, I think, where you can move forward and build businesses. And then look at uh, Ivanhoe Mines. I mean, what, what a great success story on DRC. Look at Lundin Gold. I think they got the best multiple in the mid-tier gold business, and they're in Ecuador. So I, I think this safe jurisdiction um, slogan is uh, is misunderstood. I tend to agree with you. I, but I do have to ask the question here on the pod is as everybody's, uh, you know, a lot of people are wondering, uh, Christian, listen, this it's been a whirlwind of a, uh, I don't know, six months for Adventus. I mean, this wasn't the only deal on the books. I mean, earlier in the year, you closed the deal uh, with uh, with Luminex Resources. Uh, there was a, a deal with Jogmec with Adventus before. And so there's a lot of moving parts here. And maybe, is it is it time to just kind of settle now that this silver corp deal is done and continue to mush the, push these Ecuadorian projects forward into the next, you know, into the next cycle? Well, a roller coaster uh, six months, roller coaster six years. Uh, we had a, <laughs> a few presidents before the current one that uh, had a mixed uh, ride. Uh, and it was difficult to navigate uh, permitting in particular through some, some of those governments, let alone the difficult market. But I'm very proud of our team. Uh, you know, sticking together, banding together during those difficult times and getting through this with the permits. We really fought um, uh, to build our reputation, uh, to get those, uh, to get the positive result. Uh, in difficult markets, you have to be ready to look at everything. Uh, last year, we looked at everything and anything to continue to advance through difficult political climate and permitting climate in Ecuador. And uh, I forever grateful to Ross Beatty and his team for hooking up with us and uh, and seeing mutual benefit and most importantly for us putting in the capital that we needed in Q4 last year to get through the elections and the permitting process and then voila you know in six months everything's turned uh, for the positive and the biggest benefactors I think at all of them is Luminex if you think about it Luminex uh, 
while great projects, early stage large copper gold exploration properties in, in Ecuador. Uh, they got to tag along with Adventus with the next copper mine to be built globally. And then soon thereafter, tag along with Silvercorp, a very liquid, very well uh, run operator. So um, I, I think it's a good outcome for all shareholders, great outcome for the Luminex shareholders and, and, and Ross Petey. Um, but ultimately, we were going to we were going to continue to plow ahead and charge and work as hard as we could to to you know, to to do good for our shareholders. Uh, there's been a lot of good M and A. Uh, usually, some of this stuff happens too late in the cycle when things are have already gotten real frothy. But it seems like we're still early stages here. Maybe let's leave it at that question for the both of you. Talk about the timing of all this. Um, you know, and why it made sense is this preparation for another big move and not only precious metals prices that we've seen, but also copper prices. Well, one of the unique things about Adventus in a developer, exploration developer universe is that we knew back in 2017 that Eldoma was going to be a mine and we stuck with it and we pushed hard regardless of difficult markets because we wanted to be the next copper mine to be built. We wanted to be in production as soon as possible, in this case in 2026, because at least I believe copper prices are going to be at all-time highs and much, much higher than where they are today. That's a differentiator. And as a result, we think we are two to three years ahead of the next copper development project globally, you know, Greenfield's copper development project. And we just happen to have a lot of gold. You know, if you just, just look at our resource base, we're a gold company. If you look at the primary project that we're advancing, it's it's a copper gold company. So for uh, for Silver Corp here, uh, they've got a lot of value here to unlock with their balance sheet, and I think the time is going to be perfect uh, for for them and us to, to do so. All right, Christian, Lon, congratulations on on this deal. Uh, it's going to be a very exciting time for Silver Corp. It, company just got a lot bigger uh let's uh, follow the story as we continue here through the year and through these markets i appreciate your time both of you thank you thank you thanks Trevor. appreciate it all right all right everybody then that's a wrap here this weekend we will be back on monday morning with the morning briefing have yourself a wonderful weekend be well <laughs>